Hello and welcome. I'm Laura Brody, uh, one of the main curators for Opulent Mobility. And for description purposes, I am a Caucasian middle-aged woman with brown hair down to my shoulders in front of a very full bookshelf. Welcome, Ash. Thank you Hi. so much for joining. Yes, it's so wonderful to be here. And I'll do a quick visual description of myself as well. Um, I'm a about 30-year-old white presenting uh, non-binary person with short brown hair. I think it was last year that you got involved with opulent mobility for the first part. And that one is a very glittery pink <laughs> in a very glittery pink frame. I'll show that later. But what, how did you find out about it? Yeah. So I am fairly involved with like the disability and chronic illness community online. And um, I think it was through Instagram like mutual friends, somebody was like promoting it on their Instagram story. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. I really love the idea behind making, uh, like making it more of a celebration and an opulence instead of, I feel like a lot of uh, disability chronic illness shows uh, when they're curated by people not in the community, it's a little more <laughs> intense and sad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've that sometimes you fall into, it's totally appropriate, but sometimes it gets a little trauma porn. Yeah, a little bit. Um, and, you know, it's not everything is so like, there's a ton of stuff that's, you know, terrible about being sick all the time. But I feel like it's not all doom and gloom. There's like this beautiful community um, that surrounds disability and chronic illness. So yeah, it was exciting to see that sort of celebrated. Thank you. I'm so glad because you've been doing a lot of the chronically online gallery was a big thing that you were doing. Yeah, I started that in, I believe, 2021. Uh, the idea behind it was originally to, it was like a 3D gallery space. And the idea behind it was originally to sort of um, create fake documentation in a space that was so good that it gave people who were chronically ill and disabled like more opportunities. Because, you know, hanging your work is a big um, hurdle for people, um, just anyone, but especially if you're chronically ill or disabled. Uh, and you can't really get opportunities <laughs> without having work documented that way. Um, so my idea was, you know, we'll fake it so well that people can get opportunities from it. Um, and then it wound up becoming like a really amazing community. Oh, that's awesome. Have you been keeping in touch with them people regularly? Yeah, I keep in touch with um, most everyone I've worked with. And then all the artists that were in the shows that I curated, um, I talk to them I like follow their careers and you know try to <laughs> promote what they're doing now which is really cool um yeah it's a great way to do that and again it, it does become an, a community and you tend to live a lot more online when you're chronically ill because that's where you can yeah uh, especially I feel like yeah the pandemic and the masking going away and I just had COVID twice uh oh no I'm so sorry yeah, terrible. I'm on immunosuppressant, so it's not super surprising, but it's like when you're in like these tightly dense packed cities. I'm I live in New York. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> nobody masks um anymore and no nope. people just walk around sick. So it just yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm hoping you're feeling better. Yeah, I just they're treating me for bronchitis and then that'll hopefully be the end of it. <laughs> but Ugh. I am feeling a lot better. It was a rough it was a rough start to my fall. No fun. No yeah. fun at all. <laughs> what else have you been doing in the art realm? Yeah, so um, recently I've been a part of something called New York City Crit Club Canopy Program, which is sort of like this online sort of class where you're with a cohort for a whole year and you talk a lot about your work. Uh, when I started, they asked me like, what's a goal I'm thinking about a lot? And mm -hmm. the goal I talked about was a lot of my artworks meant to be encountered online, but that presents an issue when you move it into a gallery space because it kind of loses that immerse, the immersibility of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I started doing these like giant 3D prints, um, sculptures and sort of creating these frames for the work, both when they're on a TV and when they're still images and sort of I think that that helps with the immersive quality and then also thinking a lot about the body and digital space back into physical space. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I wanted to show a couple of the works. First off, um, show the work that you put in for this show. So mm -hmm. this is one of the more 3D ones. 
Yes. And is it like 3D printing combined with painting? What? How did you make create this work? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so the frame, the white frame portion is 3D printing. Um, I, I actually sculpt those on my phone on an app to and from when I'm on the subway, which I think is really wonderful and accessible. I love, <laughs> I love doing that. Um, and then those are 3D printed. I have a printer out in New Jersey that I use. Um, and then the middle part is aluminum. It's an aluminum print. Um, Interesting. And, yeah. So it was, it's a collage of uh, a bunch of different body parts, hands, tubes, uh, medical diagrams. Um, and then intestines that are like sort of neon colored. Um, yes. And thinking about uh, fecal microbial transplants, I don't know. <laughs> Not everybody <laughs> knows about them, but yeah, they, it can be life saving. Yeah, I I was reading a memoir where the person wound up having, I believe, Lyme disease, but for the longest time they couldn't figure out what was going mm. on. And she actually did some medical tourism where she went and got a fecal microbial transplant, and I think somewhere in Europe, but um it, she talked about it being like really life-changing and you know it's it's interesting because people outside of the I feel like everyone I feel in the chronic illness community I bring it up and they're like yeah fecal microbial transplants but like people outside of it you just kind of think that's disgusting <laughs> um so I wanted to like sort of celebrate this I, this medical procedure that a ton of people think are is like so gross that they would never try it but like when you get into a space with chronic illness and somebody's like, yeah, if you just do this thing, you'll feel a ton better. Um, and I've heard great things about it. I personally have never done it. But... Yeah, I haven't either, but I know people who have and for whom it's actually saved their lives. Yeah. Um, I know more people who are just trying to look into it. And usually it is because they've developed something and like, I don't know what else to do, you yeah. know? And that sometimes it can just sort of reset your body so it can fight off whatever is attacking it. I have like some issues with digestion. Uh, turns out I finally got it diagnosed. I have Ehlers-Danlos, which is a genetic thing, but it can cause a lot of stomach and intestinal issues for mm. ages. I had no idea. They were like, I don't, I don't think it's the lupus. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, almost anybody that I know who's got chronic illness, there's so many things and that it doesn't get diagnosed very quickly or easily. And there's a lot of medical gaslighting. So I'm hoping that you're getting some good care. Yeah, I since I moved to New York, I when I lived in previously before I moved to New York, I had like this mysterious undiagnosed thing from when I was like in my early 20s. I'm 28, mm -hmm. almost 29 now. Um, so it started up in my early twenties. I moved to New York and then the second rheumatologist I saw in New York was like, yeah, this is definitely lupus. And well, was, glad, glad we figured that out. Yeah, I know. I was like, where have you been for the last eight years? Eh, well, I'm, I know it's terrible and frustrating, but I'm really glad you got somebody good now. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then after that, shortly after that, different rheumatologist was checking me out and she like, moved my arm and she was like you know you're like double jointed do you have like Ehlers-Danlos in your family and I was like yeah my grandpa had that and then I've had a great-grandmother who probably died from it when she had like uh because you can have like stomach stuff where it like rips open um, oh ooh. yeah so I was like yeah I have family members with that and then after that it was really quick to diagnose me with it as well. it's always easier when you know that right <laughs> yeah a little yeah. knowledge is great I also wanted to show um, you know, the piece that you put in last year's show. So this is one of the more flat works, I guess. Yes. So uh, is it also a digital collage? It is a digital collage and it's also uh, 3D scanning of my face. So that's where you get like the sort of pixelated breakup around my hair um, and body going in because uh, it's a 3D scan. I didn't realize that that's what you had done. I mean, I could kind of tell it was you, but... Yeah not how you were getting there yeah most people don't realize both figures are me um and people never realize it's me in my work and then they're always surprised and off put when they meet me in person they're like i would have never guessed that was you i'm like yeah it's kind of like a persona <laughs> not kind of boring in real life but <laughs> yeah, you know but this is this is who you are but you're yeah. also the doctor then i am also the doctor in this um thinking nice lot, yeah thinking a lot about like um medical patient gaze versus like medical gaze versus patient gaze um 
and sort of like being femme presenting in that sort of space. Um, and I think that also it was like kind of a real, real breakout piece for me because I had started using a cane uh, before they put me on steroids for my lupus. I had like the whole part, half of my body was weaker than the other half. And I was having issues with balance and stuff and that's resolved, but I was using a cane for over a year um, with a mysterious undiagnosed thing. And uh, I felt mm. very self-conscious about it. And, um, you know, it was definitely a point where I was like, I guess I am disabled <laughs> because it's like, as soon as you have like mobility issues, it becomes ser super serious. Um, and yeah, I think it was a breakout piece for me because it was like, I was very boldly embracing it to myself, I guess, um, especially in the persona. Yeah. yeah. Is that something that you found is a way for you to handle things sometimes to create a persona for it? Yeah, definitely. I feel like uh, I have like people, <laughs> people are always like, oh, your Jesus loves memes. I would have never guessed. And I feel like that's kind of on purpose. It's definitely an online persona that I sort of, I enjoy performance and drag a lot. So I definitely consider it a lot, very connected to performance and drag. Got it. Got it. So it, this is, by the way, another way that you can find Ash is through Jesus Loves Memes, um, both through uh, Instagram and just online. Yeah, just online. Yeah. And it's L U V S, not L O V E S. What made you come up with that for the yeah. as a term? I was in college, and a lot of my like college art was really inspired by religion, um, particularly Christianity, but also thinking about. Uh, how we move spirituality into like internet spaces. I grew up in a very Catholic community where all my friends have like MySpace stickers with sparkling Jesus on them and stuff like that, that I always really loved. Um, and I think a lot of my work is still connecting into in ways to like spirituality. And I think a lot about shrine making or like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, you've, sort, you've got sort that of feel. on that way. Yeah. It's good. Well, certainly the piece, this recent piece has that kind of altar like feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It's, what sorts of images sort of inspired you when you were first starting making art? Yeah, I think that I grew up in sort of like a lower class family. So we didn't have, I didn't have access to like fine art, fine art, like quote unquote fine art, like a lot of people I knew in college did. Um, I was definitely like behind the curve. It felt like with understanding uh, the language that fine artists speak quote unquote um so most of the most of the exposure to art I had as a kid was like religious art uh my dad's Vietnamese and he's also had like a ton of Buddhist art around the house so I think I definitely drew from that and then I grew up in a Catholic neighborhood and like the appeal of like Catholic imagery is mm. inescapable for me so. yeah of course there's a little less of a sense of depth that there's that really ornate edging around everything yeah yeah definitely um yeah there's something so bodily and beautiful about like catholic imagery and i think that before i even knew what was going on with my body that like definitely resonated with me <laughs> yeah. got it so a much more embodied thing do you tend to work more with figurative art with people yeah, I think that I'm definitely like a maximalist and a, and a figurative artist, right? <laughs> um, Nothing wrong with that. No, definitely not. I feel like uh, occasionally I'll try to like scale back into minimalism and I'm never happy. I need like more figures. I need more colors. More glitter. <laughs> more shapes, more glitter. <laughs> Had you started out doing work online? It Was that your first experience with art or...? Yeah, now that I think about it, I in in high school I had like a digital photo class. Uh, we didn't have a dark room at my high school, um, so they gave you like little point and shoot cameras, and I like became obsessed with it. Before that, I was really into MySpace, so it was like weird MySpace kids dream to just be shooting on this point and shoot camera. Um, and from there, I got really into it. But it was always like the photos weren't the photos that felt like they didn't need to be printed to me. They always felt like they lived online, even then, like. Mm. Kind of on your Flickr account or on your yeah. Deviant Art account, um, and all those weird little art spaces that sort of existed in the yeah. 2010s. Now, I've been talking, you know, that one of the other artists, Austin Lebetkin, does a lot of stuff that's online and that's interactive with apps, and about the idea of what happens when maybe that doesn't exist anymore. What happens when the format or the platform is gone? Um, 
is that something that is a concern to you or is it something that you just want to morph into the next one? I think that it is like something very interesting and I get freaked out a little bit thinking about it because I'm always like my whole life is on Instagram and then what happens when Instagram's not there. Um, I was listening to this, was it a podcast or I was reading something about um, AI girlfriends became a thing, like AI significant partners became a thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've been seeing that. I'm like, oh, do you really want, do you really trust the algorithm to be saving yeah. your information that way? First yeah. off. And not only that, like they changed the, I guess the, the coding on the, on the significant partner and it like changed their personality. And people were talking about how devastated they were after that happened. I thought that was so interesting because I think a lot about how connected I am to certain things online and what happens if that thing is gone. I yeah. I think just because I've had so gone through a bunch of different changes of format that those things just died. Zip disks, no longer. It'd be interesting to figure out what happens with that, what happens with digital over time. Yeah, I think I'm definitely interested in the idea of like digital decay. Um, oh, yeah. Breaking down of digital bodies. Um, I think a lot about like the footprints we leave online too. Like if you have a friend who dies on Facebook, there's like their whole page turns into a memorial page. And then every year you get sort of reminded that it's their birthday and everybody's writing memorial messages. Um, but also like just the, the footprints we live online become sort of like this weird digital tomb for us after we die. That, that definitely influences my work a lot. Like this idea of like death and altar making and digital spaces. Um, yeah. I know. Is that kind of like a way of living on? Yeah. In, it's, the, in the digital? Yeah. It's like, uh, I always joke that like when we upload our brains to the cloud, who's going to, to like save us from global warming, who's, whose brain is going to be uploaded. I doubt it's mine. So I don't know. Unless, Could unless be a combination. Yeah. Um, so in a way, I guess like digital footprints act as like this sort of living a memorial. I mostly use like, um, I gather the majority of my imagery from um, like stock images of like, I'm really interested in stock advertising images. Um, okay. Which I think are sort of feed into like my thoughts around wellness and like how it's sort of like, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So I, but occasionally I do have like a very specific image in mind um, and you can't, like I can't find it in any stock image. So occasionally if I have like a tiny piece of a piece that I'm like, I really need an image for that, like plastic telephone on fire. Um, hard to find images of that. So I will sometimes like throw it into AI or, and then export that little portion of the collage and then mess with it digitally beyond that um, as like a materials for collage, I guess. Interesting. Okay. And then just piece it into the rest of the work. Yeah. It's <laughs> none of my work is like totally AI. I will occasionally pull from AI if I can't find anything else. I do like using like sort of real advertising imagery, I guess, but it's also interesting to see, like I've been doing things where I throw like advertising imagery, that's stock imagery into AI and tell it to generate more of those and seeing how the computer sort of decay. Oh, interesting. Yeah. What kinds of stuff have you been finding with that? Yeah, it's funny. It's like it it very quickly gets into like uncanny valley. Is there stuff that you want to be making next? Yeah, so uh, I have a bunch of sculptures I have planned. I'm hoping to like maybe move into some. I've been talking about moving into augmented reality for so long and I just haven't done it. Oh. Um, so excited to maybe do that eventually. Um, and then I've also been... I have been doing less of myself in the work lately. And so thinking about how I could digitally alter my, or like alter myself with digital sculpture um, to add back into the work um, is definitely something I'm starting to think about lately. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm really glad that you can be part of the show again. Yeah, and, so uh, honored. <laughs> Thank oh, you. That's awesome. No, I think it's really, I love that this piece that you came up with both Anthony and I love them just because it's so such a unique take on everything. And it's honestly, I can keep looking at them and find something else in the little corners. Like, what is that piece? <laughs> and that's, that's always nice. The, that kind of layered approach to it is really lovely. So Thank you. nicely done.